It is a disgrace that men now in their 70s are being dragged from their homes in dawn raids and carted off to Northern Ireland. Nearly half a century later, But let us remind people that the fight in Northern Ireland was a filthy one. You were dressed in the Queen's uniform. You were visible. Your enemy destroying the people of Northern Ireland. Your enemy were lurking in the shadows, using civilians as human shields. They were despicable, and you were abiding by the rule of law. They say they're struggling to recruit new members of the forces. Is that a surprise? No. No. The way that they treat us? Well, today is wake-up day for them because we are here to let them know that the vast majority of the people of this United Kingdom support us. Veterans are being de treated despicably by this government, not just Northern Ireland, but we're talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places to follow, no doubt. You know, it's got to stop. We have a job to do. We have seconds to make decisions when we're out in the field. Not minutes, not like a debate in the Houses of Parliament. We have seconds. smash them tonight, okay? 
Um, the story that I want to tell you about is about a young, bullied, insecure, unpopular kid who was born 10 miles from here in Farnham. My earliest memories were of my mother returning home from working in the hospital laundry, my grandmother looking after me. I never knew my father. He was a thief and not a very good one because he got caught and he was in prison for the whole of my childhood. At the age of six, my mother got pregnant while he was in prison, so he, with his moral high ground, divorced her. And um, at the age of seven, she married a man who gave me his name, called Geoffrey Horsfall, and he adopted me. And from that point onward, I began probably the happiest part of my childhood, in the sense that I had a home, I had security, and we went to live in West Germany. My father was a soldier, and we lived in Germany from the age of eight until I became 11 years old. At the age of 11, sadly, we, he finished his military time, and we returned back to England. And I went from being happy army brat to young grammar school boy in middle class Surrey. Um, I remember the first day of school when I was told I wasn't allowed to use a biro, I had to go home and buy a fountain pen, which was a nice introduction to grammar school in Surrey. Um, my father had left the army, he went from being secure, he went from having an income, he went from having a free home to a point where he was now a unskilled labourer working in a garage. We lived in my grandmother's house, I had three bro uh, two brothers and a sister, and there were three bedrooms upstairs, one which was occupied by my grandmother, another which was occupied by my mum and dad, and the other which was occupied by the four children in, in a bunk bed, so two up, two down, top and tail. And um, surprisingly enough, I don't ever remember being particularly unhappy with that arrangement. It was always warm in winter. You put your shirt on under the blankets in the morning because the ice was coming down. You went downstairs, you waited for, I waited for my grandmother to light the fire, listened to the shipping forecast, and then got ready for school. The sad thing about it was that it's very difficult to come home to that environment with two hours of homework every evening and complete your tasks for the following morning. And I went from being a very, very good student at the age of 12 to being the school truant by the age of 14. As soon as I discovered that I could cycle to school, cycle home when the house is empty, get my fishing gear out and go fishing, that was what I decided to do. As my work got worse, I decided to run away from it. And I was very, very lucky because at the age of 15, school, when I was 15, school leaving age, whoops, school leaving age was also 15. And there were 15,000 boys between the age of 15 and 17 in full time in the British Army in 1972. In 1973, the school leaving age went up to 16. I tried to join the British Army as a member of the Royal Army Medical Corps. I'd been a St. John's Ambulance boy. I'd enjoyed being a St. John's Ambulance boy. I loved it. And they said, no, no, you're not the right sort of character to do that sort of job. What else would you like to do? I said, oh, I'd like to be a military policeman. They said, why would you like to do that? I said, well, I fancy the idea of having a dog. They said, no, 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 you can't do that. And somehow, I ended up going from being a member of the Royal Army Medical Corps uh, to a member of the Parachute Regiment. Come to a halt 
and we're going to take a letter in to the Prime Minister. And I want to read that letter to you before we present it, because it's on your behalf, and it's on behalf of all the soldiers that served in Northern Ireland between 1969 and 2007. We have been asked by our members to draw your attention to the ongoing campaign by Sinn Féin IRA against the United Kingdom. It has always been the stated intention of Sinn Féin IRA to achieve a united Ireland by any available means. They have currently decided to take the political path to achieve those aims. If a time should come when they do not continue to make progress, they have also made it clear that they will return to violence. The recent arrests directed against former soldiers who served in Northern Ireland are not an attempt at bringing criminals to account. These arrests are political in their intent, with the purpose of undermining the confidence of the UK government and its armed forces. The low-ranking individuals so far arrested have been targeted to further the political aims of Sinn Féin IRA. The director of public prosecution for Northern Ireland cannot be considered impartial. He and his family are deeply embedded with Sinn Féin IRA. That fact alone should be enough to expose these prosecutions to be malicious political attacks on behalf of the gangsters that maintained a 30-year campaign against the laws of all the peoples of the United Kingdom. That campaign is ongoing and these persecutions are just another form of attack. These prosecutions are a direct result of the Good Friday Agreement. We attach a letter from John Reid, former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, to Prime Minister Tony Blair dated 4th of May 2001, in which Mr Reid states, the legislation should exclude members of the security forces. What we want to know is was this exclusion hidden from Parliament? These actions by the Blair government were a betrayal of all that we hold dear. Yeah. 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 No British soldier ever went on patrol with the intention of committing a crime. No British soldier ever placed a bomb in a pub full of innocents. No British soldier ever placed a bomb under a policeman's car. Prime Minister, please do not allow this appalling situation to continue. It is our belief that the government is operating a policy of appeasement. Perhaps they believe that the sacrifice of a few former soldiers to prevent Sinn Féin IRA from returning to violence is a price worth paying. If so, this is a terrible error. History, history proves that submitting to blackmail simply makes matters worse. Sinn Féin IRA claim that the incidents they are highlighting were not adequately investigated at the time. Every time a soldier opened fire in Northern Ireland, he was thoroughly investigated by the Royal Ulster Constabulary. 
These current prosecutions are an assault on our sense of honesty and decency. Expected to take place in Armagh, the heartland of the provisional IRA. Any judge delegated to try these cases will be subject to the coercion and intimidation of armed criminals. We attach several replies that our members received from their members of parliament. Note the almost identical paragraphs contained in most of these replies. They hide behind legal niceties. When laws are used maliciously against the interests of our people and our nation, then they are bad laws and should be vigorously opposed or changed. We expect our elected representatives to take these matters seriously. We do not expect to receive bland official copies put out to fend off our concerns. We deserve better from our government, and we hope for better from you, Prime Minister. If we cannot get justice from Parliament, then who can we get it from? We understand that our own taxpayers are funding these prosecutions. How is it possible that we are paying gangsters for their legal teams to take legal action against our own protectors. 100% of the 55,000 casualties in the province were caused by the actions of criminals on both sides of the sectarian divide. Gangsters who considered the murder of anyone by bomb or bullet justified. Our soldiers, us, stood between them and were attacked while they attempted to maintain law and order. There are more than 100,000 former soldiers still alive in the United Kingdom today who served their nation in Ulster. Those soldiers not only faced our enemies on the streets of Ireland, but also at home. They defended the liberties and freedoms of our people at the behest of Her Majesty's government. The soldiers of that generation believed they were the good guys, risking their lives to protect the people of Ulster. Margaret Thatcher would turn in her grave. She would turn in her grave to see what is happening to her boys today. The failure of this government to defend our veterans could result in a severe loss of morale in the armed forces and create a reluctance for the next generation to enlist. If the United Kingdom is to maintain armed forces that are capable of defending our country, then they must feel that you, Prime Minister, are watching their backs. We now look to you for leadership and support. We need a Churchill, not a Chamberlain. I have here some sample responses from our MPs. 
Some are supportive, but most are copies that repeat the word. 90% of the victims of the Troubles were as a consequence of terrorist activities. So who carried out the other 10%? Because I'm telling you, we certainly didn't. What happens when a soldier hesitates to defend himself? Well, let me remind you of Corporals Wood and Howes, March 1988. Dragged from their car by a mob. They didn't use their weapons. They hesitated. And as a consequence, on camera, they were dragged and murdered, beaten to death by a Republican mob in Andersonstown. That's what happens when soldiers are not allowed to decide whether it's time to pull the trigger or not. There's a foul smell that emanates from those letters, and there's a foul smell that emanates from that house over there. Yeah. Yeah. It's the smell of fear. It's the smell of cowardice. It's the smell of betrayal. They are betraying us because they don't care. Yeah. We defended you. Now it's your turn to defend us. Stop! Stop the funding. Sack the DBP, the Dep Director of Public Prosecutions, and save our troops. If you can't defend your army, then you don't deserve to have an army. Today is just the beginning. When you go home today, get prepared to come back. And every one of you should be looking for 10 comrades, 10 friends, 10 former soldiers or 10 supporters to come back. So that next time we're not 1,000, we're 10,000, we're 15,000, because this is just the beginning. If our government can't defend us, the time may come when we need to defend ourselves. Yeah. Yeah.